Hi, so welcome on behalf of our bipartisan and bicameral leadership to this briefing of the Health Safety Commission. Uh, the Health Safety Commission is mandated to monitor compliance with international norms and standards in Europe. This includes norms in the military affairs, economic and environmental affairs, and human rights. I cover that second category. I do a lot of work in anti-corruption and economics. And I am just so honored and pleased to have with us today uh, Minister John Penrose, uh, the Prime Minister's anti-corruption champion, all the way from the United Kingdom. So I'd like to make a quick administrative announcement that we'll be ending at 10.15. Uh, even if we have remaining questions, even if there are other burning concerns, we are ending sharp at 10.15. Um, so just the briefest of, of opening remarks. Uh, globalized corruption is one of the greatest threats facing the United States today. Authoritarian kleptocrats exploit the global financial system to hide their ill-gotten gains on our shores and those of our allies, providing protection for their stolen assets and a vector of influence into our political systems. Once established, these kleptocrats set about hollowing out the rule of law and our institutions to better serve their preferences. Much remains to be done to close these loopholes that enable this malign activity, but Congress is taking action and the United Kingdom is taking action. We're very excited to hear about uh, what the United Kingdom is doing today. So with that, I'll very shortly introduce uh, Minister Penrose. As, as discussed, Minister Penrose is the UK Prime Minister's anti-corruption champion. He's in charge of coordinating the UK response to corruption and implementing the UK anti-corruption strategy. He's in charge of leading the UK's push to strengthen the international response to corruption, which is what he's doing here and what he'll be doing in Canada uh, right after this. Um, and he's in charge of engaging with external stakeholders, so I guess that's us, right? Um, so with that, uh, please, Mr. Penrose, thanks a lot. Thank you, Roger. Am I okay to stand up? Can everybody hear me if I stand up? Okay, I, I, will, I will do that, and then that way I... I present a moving target. Sorry, actually, I hate, to, yeah, I, hate to, I hate to interrupt. I think it's just for C-SPAN, I think we got to speak in the mic, right? Can you speak in the mic? Yeah, I, yeah so can, speak can you turn it on and maybe stand up? Would that work? Let's try that. Uh, talk. Does that work? Am I, uh, are you getting enough sound on that? Should I keep talking and see? Is that enough? It's fine. Yeah, yeah. you sure? Super. All right, we got it. Okay, we got it. Right, well, marvelous. So I, I can't present a moving target because I have to stand roughly <laughs> here, but beyond that, we're all set. Look, firstly, Thank you very much for inviting me here this morning. Um, Paul put it beautifully in his introduction just now. Uh, we share a common threat, and I'm here because I believe that we can also share a common response to that threat um, if we get our acts together and if we work together um, in yet another example of you know, one of the oldest alliances in the, on the planet trying to make this work together. And the reason why we share the threat is very simply that uh, we both, both our countries, pay host to two of the largest uh, financial centres on the planet. So if it's the City of London, whether it's New York, whether it's incorporated companies in the state of Delaware, both of our countries are right up there in terms of the leadership and the, the, the market share which both countries um, command. What does that mean? Well, it means that, as Paul rightly said, there's an enormous amount of money, billions, trillions of dollars, every single day, sloshing through the city of London, sloshing through New York, and it only takes a tiny fraction, a tiny fraction of 1% of all that money every day to be dirty, to be the proceeds of crime, to be put there by organized criminals of one kind or another, whether they are drug kingpins, whether they are gun runners, whether they are foreign state actors trying to undermine our country's democracies, a tiny amount of that, and it creates an enormous reputational risk for our countries. Because be under no illusion, ladies and gentlemen, there is a reputational risk because these people want to create it for us. They want to do it to us. An awful lot of the criticism that you will hear from populists political movements around the globe, but also from people who want to undermine our rules-based system, is to say you cannot trust these guys, you cannot trust these, these men and women in Washington, you can't trust them in Westminster, in London, because the entire system is corrupt. The entire system is stacked against ordinary people, and if we let them, they will say, and therefore you don't have to abide by their rules, because their rules are skewed. Their rules are trying to hold down regular folk 
in, their, in the interests of an elite, and therefore the entire system needs to be changed and brought crashing down. And if, like me, you care about a rules-based system because you care about democracy and you care about a capitalist democracy in particular, then that rules-based system really matters. And the argument to say this does not fly and it undermines and it is stacked against the, the, the ordinary man and woman in the, in, the, in the street, that argument is incredibly corrosive. It is powerful and it is dangerous for all of us in both our countries. And that's why I'm here. It's because I believe that if we work together, as two of the leading countries and two of the leading fi um, uh, financial centers on the planet, then we can fight against this, and with any luck, we can win. So what can we do? How can we fight against this? Well, there are lots of different things that need to be done. Everything from um, better, stronger, um, uh, I'm, I'm losing me. Yeah, I'll get it. Losing me in a Everything from better or stronger um, responses from law enforcement officials, um, through the better exchange of financial information and sharing of intelligence between both uh, investigative agencies here in the States and in the UK, but across the Atlantic as well. All of those things matter. But they aren't enough on their own, because if you talk to law enforcement inspectors and investigators, they will say, we, that all works for us up to a point, but sooner or later, these drugs kingpins, these gun runners, these organized criminals, they've got smart lawyers, they've got smart accountants, and they move money all the way around the world. They bounce money from one jurisdiction to another to another, and they have nested companies and trusts and foundations right way around the world. And when we try to follow the money, we're fine until we get to a secrecy jurisdiction. And when we get to a secrecy jurisdiction, or at least one that just doesn't have the information in a convenient or accessible fashion, then we hit a brick wall. And it's incredibly frustrating. We can get no further, and that means that we cannot bring the people to justice who richly deserve it. And it isn't just a question of putting people behind bars, although that's great, of course. It's also a question of going after the assets which have been bought with the dirty money. And my country, if you go to parts of London, equally in this country, I'm told, anecdotally, go, part, go, go, to, go to some of the, some American cities, and you find people who are swanning around living incredibly bling lifestyles living in multi-zillion dollar apartments, which they have bought with dirty money, sooner or later, people who are trying to do the right thing, people who are trying to live honest lives, people who are trying to follow the rules-based system, which we have all created in order to ensure order and a sensible capitalist economy, sooner or later, they're gonna turn around, they're gonna say, do you know what? We're following these rules, and these guys aren't, and who's doing better? Who is the one driving the Ferrari? Who's the one living in the marvelous multi-zillion dollar duplex apartment? Well, it's not me. It's that kleptocrat over there. It's that organized criminal over there. It's that gang boss over there. And we are going to start to lose credibility. We're going to start to lose legitimacy. And so therefore, yes, put these people behind bars, but also go after their money, go after their assets, hit them where it hurts in the pocketbook. And because that matters enormously and it shows people that we care and it shows people that we are serious. How do we do it? Well, as I said, all sorts of things we can do with better enforcement, better um, sharing of data and information. But ultimately, the way to ensure that you can follow the money is to make sure that the audit trail works. And the way you can do that, and one of the reasons why I'm here, why I'm off, why I'm off to the uh, Open Government Conference in Ottawa very shortly later on today, um, is to talk about something called um, beneficial ownership registers. I was saying last night at a, at a very good event, um, it's a lousy piece of branding. We have to find a sexier name for this thing, but ultimately it may be lousy branding, but it does something very, very important indeed. It establishes that audit trail in whichever country the drug kingpins try to move their money to. And it says, look, we don't need to know everybody who owns every single share in every single company, in every single country. That's a level of intrusion into privacy that we don't need to have. But what we do need to know is who controls shell companies? For whose benefit are shell companies being run? And that means you need to know who the main directors are and who the controlling economic actors are, who owns the majority shares in it. You don't need to know everybody else, but you do need to know who controls the shares in these companies because if you have a shell company and it's moving money around on behalf of drugs, kingpin, kingpins and everybody else, you need to be able to follow that cash, otherwise you will never, 
You will never get to those assets. You will never be able to sequester them. You will never be able to get them back. And you will never be able to show the man and the woman in the street that the system is on their side and not on the side of the kleptocrats and the organised criminals. So what the UK is doing, and we would love it, ladies and gentlemen, the reason why I'm here is we would love it if you guys in the States would be part of this at some level. It will be transformation if the USA, with all its heft and its might and its global leadership, could be part of this. What we are trying to do in the UK is we are trying to set up something which will effectively create a global norm to say, let's all have some kind of a register about who owns and controls these companies. We're not asking for the moon, as I said, we don't need to know everybody who owns a, owns a piece of every company, we just need to know who the controlling minds and controlling interests are. And if, at that point, that is available around the world, and certainly in major centres like the UK and in the USA, then we can start to make sure that that audit trail works and there will be no place to hide. We will be shining a spotlight into some of the murkiest corners of our, of our planet's financial system and they will not be able to go anywhere at all and hide their money anywhere. Sunlight is the best disinfectant, as the saying goes. And so, that's what we're trying to do in the UK. We, would, we, we aren't perfect, incidentally, nowhere on the planet perfect yet. This is a fairly new political movement. It is something which has been developing over the last few years and has further to go. So the UK, I'm not only claiming for what we can do, we are perhaps in the vanguard here, but we are the tallest pygmy. That's all. There is an enormous amount more which we as a nation and we as a planet need to do in order to deal with what is effectively a global problem, as we all know. But we would love it if you guys could come with us and be part of this. Because the people who will hate us if we do this will be the drug lords, will be the governments, will be the kleptocrats and the organized criminals. But the people who will love us, the people who will say this is a great thing, you are starting to drain the swamp, they will say, the people who will love all that will be the victims of corruption, the powers, the people who are always on the receiving end of be it grand corruption, be it petty corruption, it doesn't matter if someone is just asking for a small bribe, which may be utterly unaffordable to someone on a low wage, or someone is the victim of a much larger institutionalized piece of dishonesty. But ultimately, they are the people who we will be serving. They are the people who will benefit from this kind of measure. And they are the people who won't just thank us in their thousands and thank us in their hundreds of thousands and thank us in their millions, the marvellous thing, ladies and gentlemen, is they will vote for us as well. And I don't care which side of the aisle you are on, that matters, it counts. And in any democracy, it is the route to having a political legacy which anybody can be proud of. So they may not quite erect statues in your name just yet, but it matters and we can do well by doing good. So thank you very much for inviting me here. I hope we can persuade the USA and the UK work together on this. This is something which is on the right side of history, it's on the right side of justice, and it's on the right side of everything which everybody who votes in the USA elections will surely, surely want. Thank you very much. Thank you so very much, Mr. Penrose, for those deeply meaningful remarks. I'd like now to invite up the, the our panel. Your name came back as well. <laughs> so I'm, I'm very excited today to, uh, to welcome this very distinguished panel. Their full bios are in the folders uh, that you picked up at the, at the entrance. So I'll give some short intros here. Uh, we'll first hear from Ed Kier, to my right. Ed is the illicit finance lead at the British Embassy in Washington and the US representative of the United Kingdom's new serious and organized crime network initiative. He has held many different posts in the United Kingdom's National Crime Agency, and we're extremely grateful to have him with us here today. Mark Hayes will then provide us his insights into the United Kingdom's policies. Mark is a senior advisor at Global Witness, a nonprofit that has done extraordinary work fighting globalized corruption around the world. Mark himself is an anti money laundering guru who is an invaluable member of DC's anti corruption community. And then finally, 
We'll hear from Nate Sibley, a research fellow at Hudson Institute's Cryptocracy and she did it himself in the room, though not part of the UK government. Nate has been published widely, and he and his organization have been a constant voice for curbing authoritarian capital. On a personal note, I'd like to mention that Nate was also one of the first conversations I had when I started this job in the city, and I will forever be grateful for his early insights. So Ed, please, floor yours. Thank you. Oh yeah, you gotta hit talk there. Uh, Sorry, that's the, the button talk in front of you there. Thank you, Paul. Um, I just want to start by saying that good morning, everyone. Um, I'd like to express our sincere thanks to the RC Commission for hosting this important event today. Um, part of my segment of talking will um, very much touch on collaboration and dialogue as, as a crucial tool to tackling tackling illicit finance and anti corruption issues. And it's really events like these that, that I usually enjoy um, this issue forward. So thank you very much for hosting this. So I'm going to talk um, briefly and pick up on some of the comments made by the Minister on um, beneficial ownership um, in the UK and um, what we've done so far. And then I'd like to talk a little bit more around the UK's joint money laundering intelligence task force or the GINAT, which has been a, a really um, great initiative in the UK for enhancing engagement with public and private uh, sector partners. Um, the intelligence exchange which the Chile has facilitated has been um, replicated uh, globally and it's, it's a model that, that we're very proud of. So I'd like to talk a little bit further around that. The two issues of beneficial ownership chip and Chilis are intertwined and I will uh, touch on, on why so. Um, but it's fascinating the um, interaction with law enforcement and um, the banking community being pivotal to anti-corruption, and both those issues facilitate um, such measures. So, let me talk briefly about uh, beneficial ownership in the UK. Um, the UK was the first G20 country to adopt a, um, a public beneficial ownership register in January 2016. The, um, the UK's beneficial ownership register has been absolutely fundamental, um, and I can't emphasise this enough, it's been fundamental in increasing collaboration between law enforcement and private sector bodies. Um, it's, it's evident by, by reports from the Global Witness Report that, that Mark will, will, I'm sure, touch on a little later, that um, suspicious activity reports, um, reporting has, has increased um, significantly um, by companies now from 426 reports, and quoting directly from, from Mark's previous report, but 426 reports in 2016 to 2,264 reports in, in 2017. So that just shows the, the real increase um, in reporting that we're getting because of this, um, this system. Um, indeed, requests to law, uh, request to companies house um, the, the centralised uh, committee that, uh, or, or body that administers the, the register um, has received, um, it went from 11 requests per month to 125 requests per month from law enforcement. So, we're seeing a, a, marked, uh, a marked increase in the engagement between um, law enforcement uh, in their investigations and, and how they're um, looking to, to find out who is behind um, these companies that were previously um, anonymous shell companies um, responsible for laundering um, significant proceeds of the crime. I would just say that, um, speaking purely in a, a UK context now, we, we, we have a new register in the UK. Um, and I'm not going to sit here um, before you this morning and, and the Minister will for this um, in his remarks. I'm not going to sit here and pretend that our, our register is the finished article. Um, it's not. It's not perfect, but it's a significant step. It's a significant step in identifying the individuals behind companies who are laundering significant proceeds of criminality. We've still got a long way to go uh, in, in addressing um, issues such as data verification and, and compliance. But again, speaking in a purely UK context, the fact that it's a public register um, allows us to be open to um, levels of scrutiny, people to have a look and see what data our register has, um, what we hold, and, um, and mark ways to improve it. And that's something that, that we're really proud of to be able to have that register, um, an open register, and be able uh, to be open to those levels of scrutiny. And what I would say, and I, I really want to emphasize this point, is that what we've done is a start. We're on a journey, a corporate transparency journey. 
Um, the data verifi uh, verification issues and compliance issues that, that we, we have, and, and which I'm sure Mark will touch on in his, in his remarks, um, they, um, they are um, issues that we recognise. But I, I posit this, this theory, which is that the law enforcement have a selector. But um, I'm not for a moment uh, excusing uh, inaccurate data on a register, but it gives, uh, regardless of, um, of the inaccuracy of the data, it gives law enforcement a start. It gives them a selector's work off, be that a name, be that an address. It gives them something as opposed to nothing. And that, that's, got to be, that's got to be worth something. So uh, providing law enforcement with that initial, uh, initial piece of data, initial selector, that's something um, that, that our register um, works on. There are a number of uh, measures in, in place uh, for us to, uh, to address uh, our, our data verification and, and compliance issues. Um, it will be a, a legal requirement for um, businesses to report inaccuracies um, by, by January 2020. Um, we're also looking to improve, see how we can actually improve the, uh, the system itself, the company's house system itself, making it easier for people to search uh, on, on different companies. Uh, and we are also um, embarking on a work stream that will allow us to screen the data on our beneficial uh, ownership register against our uh, sanctions data. So that cross match of data is going to be absolutely fundamental in advancing our capabilities around beneficial ownership. And it is you know, really important to emphasize that we, we recognize, um, we recognize the, the challenges we're facing and we're, we're on a journey to, to, to address them. So that's some sort of the remarks I wanted to make um, specifically around beneficial uh, ownership. I'm, I'm sure uh, Mason and Mark will have uh, more to add. Um, what I did want to touch on, and what I know that the Paul's um, very keen on, uh, on looking at, is the Joint Money Laundering Intelligence Task Force, or the GIMLET, um, which is uh, a UK model. Uh, it was developed in 2015, uh, and it uh, has um, evolved since then. But Considerable progress has been made in bringing financial institutions together with law enforcement um, to, uh, to share data and to advance investigations. And uh, it's a theme throughout the segment, hopefully, but the genuine partnership and collaboration are really at the heart of the agenda, and that's what, what makes it so successful. So there are in excess of, of 30 financial institutions in the UK who have signed up to the agenda, and I guess it's, it's easiest to think about it in, in two segments. So you've got the, uh, the operations group and you've got the uh, expert working group group. I'll address the, the, um, the operations group first, which is uh, involved in the sharing of tactical uh, financial intelligence. So um, groups are um, divided into different areas. We have groups for organised immigration crime, uh, robbery and corruption, trade-based money laundering, terrorist finance, financing, future threats, and money laundering through markets. And these groups convene on a weekly basis, and, and how that structure looks in practice is um, banks sat around the table, uh, and the, uh, each week at the operations group, a um, officer will come and bring their investigation, uh, and the banks will either in the room or in slow time go away and, uh, and search uh, their, their uh, databases to see what um, selectors they have that could assist the, uh, the investigations of the, of the officer. That uh, information is then provided back to um, the, the case officer via the National Crime Agency and so It's important to, to to sort of recognise the legislation under which the GIMLA operates. It operates under a piece of legislation in the UK called um, the Crime and Courts Act, specifically Section 7 of the Crime and Courts Act. And the information provided uh, is for intelligence purposes only. It cannot be used eventually. So, uh, should uh, useful data come back, the uh, case officer would then have to either, either parallel that information or apply uh, for more. Uh, formal proceedings via a production order. Uh, so it's, it's a gateway to be able to identify um, the extent of uh, an of illicit finance network and it's really effective in, in, in seeing where funds are being, being moved through. Um, so that's a, a really sort of key part of the GIMLA model. The 
The second strand, which I refer to, uh, is still operates more on a strategic level and it comes under the, the expert working group. And this is again a similar format. The banks are, uh, are sat around the, the, the table, um, and but also law um, enforcement agencies, so the National Crime Agent, uh, Agency, uh, commonly, uh, and strategic um, threats and trends identify emerging threats and trends which are being seen by the banks. Um, emerging threats and trends which are being seen by law enforcement. All these, uh, all these sort of emerging threats are discussed um, and often formulated into industry-wide alerts which go out um, to the banking sector and will allow them to uh, look across their, uh, their databases and identify any patterns or trends which replicate what is being seen um, in that forum. I think I certainly speak for the, the, the UK um, when I say that um, one uh, challenge we have is um, feedback to financial institutions on uh, suspicious activity reports. Often financial institutions will submit suspicious activity reports and they don't hear uh, any feedback as to actually what's the utility of that and how useful is that. The expert working group, the Jimla, really sort of assists that process because it, it allows um, the financial institutions to be able to, to get a sense of what law enforcement is seeing, what trends they're seeing, what will be most useful. So again, it comes back to dialogue being a uh, dialogue and collaboration being at the absolute centre of uh, how we operate in terms of um, addressing the finance issues and, and, um, and anti-corruption issues. A couple of, of results, it's all very well sort of sitting here listening to what the junior does, but what does it deliver? Uh, I think that's probably what, what we want to know. So uh, it's generated uh, 400 live tactical cases. Uh, it's generated 16, uh, in excess of 1,600 uh, suspicious, activity, uh, suspicious activity reports. Um, often, as I mentioned, when uh, an individual has uh, an investigation and they bring it to the gym, uh, that they will um, not necessarily be aware of the extent of the financial footprint that people are investigating. The gym has identified 3,000 accounts that previously are made to law enforcement. So if that's not value that, then, uh, then I'm not sure what, what, was, what is. Um, and 97 arrests have been assisted by a gym inquiry. So it's not, uh, it's not just a talking shop, it delivers. Uh, and and the, the, um, the delivery, the results are tangible. Uh, and finally, um, it's, uh, it's, been, it's assisted in identifying and training uh, in excess of 9 million uh, pounds. So, uh, the results are powerful. So what I'll conclude with uh, is, is saying that public-private partnerships and international engagement are at the heart of how the UK wishes to, to proceed in tackling illicit finances and anti-corruption issues. Both benefit um, it, it um, cultivates a, a system of feedback and it cultivates a system of assisting law enforcement with their investigations and equally, equally Jim that also assists in private sector and uh, law enforcement collaboration. And it's only from learning from each other, from the UK and from the US and vice versa, it's only from learning from each other that we can look to tackle the illicit finance flows that fuel organised crime groups and undermine both of our economies. Thank you.